In our former sessions, uh, we learned one chapter at a time, so I could read the Hebrew and the English, but today we have to learn 13 chapters, the longest story in the book of uh, Breshit. So I'm sorry that I cannot uh, follow the Hebrew and I must stick to the English. It's difficult enough to do it in one hour. I would like to start with uh, a uh, theological uh, preface. <coughs> there are two basic uh, theological uh, concepts in Judaism. One is uh, human free choice, and the other one is uh, divine providence. And they seem to contradict each other. The more there is a divine determinism, which means that God has a plan, the less there is freedom for us to make right or wrong decisions. And uh, this contradiction bothers us uh, quite a lot, and I don't want to deal with it on a philosophical basis. I want only to make the statement but in the story of Joseph and his brothers, these two concepts work together. God has a plan for the children of Israel to reach Egypt. In the 15th chapter of Reshit, in the covenant Brit Ben Abetarim, the covenant between the pieces, Hashem tells Abraham, Abraham, you should know that your children will be slaves in, in a foreign land for 400 years. And then I will rescue them. Which means that there is a divine plan that the children of Israel will come to Egypt. And there's another divine plan, which is that Joseph has to, uh, there must be a provider, a man in the Egyptian government who will take care of them which means that Yosef has to reach Egypt before his brothers and his father. This is clear. This is the intention of God. But are not, uh, it's a moral story. Are not the brothers of uh, Yosef to be blamed for selling their brother to slavery in Egypt? So you see that the story has two levels which perhaps logically don't, uh, we cannot always explain how they relate to each other. But it is clear that God not only punishes or rewards, rewards people or the brothers of Joseph for their actions, God has a plan in advance and he intervenes in the story itself. I would say it's important not only that the children of Israel will reach Egypt, it is even more important that the carriers of the destiny, you say carriers in English? Nos'e mm Hayehud, -hmm. uh, the carriers of the destiny, will be, uh, will be, will fit the destiny. In other words, the destiny should not be carried out by bad people, but people who better themselves. And as he was saying, testing, testing, this is a good motto for the book of the <laughs> Testing, testing. We are all tested, not only before Yom Kippur. It's a story of divine, of God uh, putting us to test. And it's a very sad story in its beginning. And the more you suffer at the beginning, you more celebrate at the end. So those of you, there are some in every uh, audience who uh, don't like me to stress the sins of our forefathers, which I do with delight. <laughs> they say it is the uh, 12 tribes of Israel, and in Hebrew they call them Hashbatim, not the sons of Yaakov, they are the Shvatim, they are the tribes. They mourn the sin at the beginning of the story, the greater their uh, tshuva at the end of the story. So if you refrain yourself from seeing the truth at the beginning, you prevent yourself also from seeing the glory at the end. So this is the deal which I have with you. 
Now, if I would have a virtual marker, I would mark with yellow the sentences of Sukim where God intervenes in the story, which will show us, which will make it clear that this is a verse speaking about providence and not about reward and punishment. All right, so this is for me very important to stress these interventions to show the two levels of our lives and especially of this story. This is enough, I believe, as an introduction. And uh, now uh, you remember that the story starts that uh, Joseph Yosef is uh, 17 years old, the beginning of the story. He will be 30 years the ruler of Egypt, or the viceroy of Pharaoh. And it says that he is, uh, I stress the lines which I need, and Yosef brought ill report, of, and he, he served as a shepherd uh, with the children of, of the uh, lower women of, of, of the, uh, assisting the sons of Ilha and sons of Zilpah, the wife of his father. And Joseph brought ill report of them to their father. It starts very bad. <laughs> which means that uh, he feels himself more attached to the father than to his brothers. And there is no brotherly solidarity. It's a very ugly behavior. And they will hate him uh, duly. And uh, we don't understand how this starts. But then in, uh, the Torah says, uh, for he was a... Ch and, uh, Joseph more, uh, and Israel and Jacob loved Yosef more than all his sons, for he was the child of his old age, and he made him an ornamented tunic. It's bad enough uh, that you favor one son more than the others, but you don't show it. It's <laughs> with an ornamented tunic. So I am sure that you in the Sunday schools learned not an on about an ornamented uh, tunic, you learned about a striped tunic, right? Cotonet Pasim. But this uh, perush is wrong, and uh, we actually don't know exactly what Cotonet Pasim means, but I read a very beautiful uh, comment uh, that says that in the book of Daniel, you remember the hand writing on the wall, Mane Mane Takelu Farsim, it says Pisat Yat, which means that this, uh, how do you call it in English? The wrist. The wrist is called uh, a pass. And two uh, wrists are called Pasim. So if this is true, no, now we, we take this Pasim from, from the book of Daniel and bring it to the tunic and says, it's a long sleeved tunic, which means that it reaches his pass yard and his pass regal. It's a long uh, tunic and a long sleeved tunic, which means it's a tunic for Shabbat, but not for the six days of working. But if you work, you put up your sleeves, right? Which may mean that Yaakov is saying, you don't have to work. You stay with me. You can bring me some information uh, about your sons, you know, 12 children or 11. Uh, they do a lot of quarreling, and uh, you bring me some information, but we will see immediately that why they go to graves at uh, Shechem, he stays at home. So if the perush for uh, the ornamented tunic is right or wrong, but it really means that there is a strong discrimination in the house of our forefather. How can we explain this? The importance of, of reading well is to read slowly and to close the book virtually and ask yourself the fact that he is the son of his old age is not enough. You know, the, what is very important about biblical narrative is that it tells the events, but not the motivation. And you have to supply the motivation. 
Here there is a piece of the motivation, but not only a piece. So I ask myself, does not Yaakov Avinu understand what each of us understands? That you hide your favor, <laughs> favorism, mm -hmm. that you don't discriminate in the open? <coughs> the answer which I offer to you is that there is a very deep affinity between yourself and Yaakov. <coughs> Because the real son of his old age is Binyamin. So what is the affinity? First of all, he was the extremely handsome son of the extremely handsome Rachel, the mother whom he loved and that passed away. Secondly, like his father, he was a dreamer. A man who was guided by his dreams. Jacob Abino had this wonderful dream of the ladder in Beit El and other dreams. And Yosef is Baal HaChalomot, the master of dreams. The most important is that Jacob was the second born who strived from the womb to be the first born. And Yosef is a latecomer in the house of, of, of Israel. And Yaakov destined him to be the Bechor. Now, uh, you, as you know, Yaakov had to make a lot of sins in order to gain the Bechorah. And the worst of it was that he had to... Uh, the after Purim, I forgot uh, how do you say it? To disguise himself. He had to disguise himself as his older brother put on uh, these uh, furs of a skin and say, Anochi Esav Bechorech. We don't want our children to, to do such things to us. Yaakov makes a deep decision what I had to undergo in the darkness to reach the Bechorah, to be the firstborn, my son will get in the open. Instead of him going with the garments of a serf, I give him the ornamented tube in the open. And I, I would like to give you a modern uh, parallel to this. Imagine a highly successful advocate in Tel Aviv. Highly successful. But it was very difficult for him to reach, uh, to be the head of, of a company of lawyers. He had no money to study, maybe he had to cheat a little, and maybe he had to cheat in the examinations. I don't know what is exactly parallel to Jacob. But it was very, very difficult for him to become one of the most prominent advocates in Tel Aviv. And he has a very talented son. And he says, you go to uh, and study law. And when he gets his degree, he makes the gravest mistake in his life. Instead of sending him to another firm to uh, prove that he is able to be a great uh, advocate, he takes him into his own company and makes him the chief partner. And you understand that everybody is hating him. Because he wants, as all of us, to save his child or the hour we do it with our children, to save our children from the hardship of life by letting them skip them, which is the greatest mistake in education. If they don't overcome the hardships of life themselves, what they reach will not be part of them. So I believe this is not to uh, mitigate what Yaakov did, this is to explain, at least in our terms, that he wanted to have a shortcut for yourself. And you know, in life, the short way is the longer way.